and welcome back guys another episode of talking shop with zyber mm -hmm. i'm waldo and i'm joined by leonardo say hi leo hi leo <laughs> that's the way nice one how you been i'm doing really well i'm uh really excited about today's episode i've got a bit of a hangover from black friday cyber monday uh, there is a lot of data out there and i'm um, you know keen to get into it a little bit and you know just just look back at what happened yeah awesome we're switching it up a bit today guys obviously it's really important for you out there to know what to do on your e-commerce store mm -hmm. all the plugins and apps and people to talk to and things to connect and so on and so forth but at the end of the day one of the most important if not the most important thing once you've got this all in place is hey, now we sit back and we wait for people to come. Or we've got some really, really cool techniques that can be uh, implemented to actually get a lot of traffic through to the site. Mm. And so on that note, we are very, very lucky to be uh, to be joined by Emily and Amy from Reload Media. Hi there. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hello. Good. Very cool. Did you guys just want to do a quick intro for those listening so they can uh, sort of know who we've got on the podcast today? Yeah, sure. So I might do, I guess, the really quick intro about Reload first. So uh, Reload are a digital marketing agency focused on developing customized solutions for businesses that basically help achieve their goals. So for us, it's all about building those really long lasting relationships with partners and essentially an extension of our clients' teams. So Reload are a global marketing agency with offices in Brisbane, London and the Philippines with a combined staff of 70 um, across the world. Um, and we work across a wide range of platforms and channels to deliver multi-channel digital marketing solutions um, that basically get real results for clients. And we know that we don't do the dev side, which is why we partner with awesome agencies like Zyber, so we can deliver a completely customized solution uh, for our clients. So our approach really starts with that customer journey and covers the overarching digital strategy from SEO, paid search, content, display, social media, and basically everything in um, and we combine, I guess, analytical data with innovative technologies and business thinking to achieve those client goals. Um, so I'm, yeah, sorry, that's the little elevator pitch. Yeah, no, that was a really good, really good intro. And thanks for the plug there, geez. Yeah. Yeah. And now, <laughs> tell us about you, Emily. And now us. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, my name is Emily and I'm the head of business development at Reload. So I look after the growth and sales team here. So essentially when any new client comes to us, they come to my team and we basically go through that whole process of really trying to understand the business objectives and then craft a, um, a customized solution that's going to help achieve their goals. Fantastic. And I'm Amy. <clears throat> so I've been at for just over 10 years, um, basically sort of since we've started and I've seen the company grow over that time and also seen a lot of changes in the digital space during those 10 years as well. Um, I'm the digital strategy director at Reload. I work really closely with Em and her team to make sure that we're setting the right strategy um, at the forefront for any client, but also that we are making sure to monitor really closely and sort of deep dive into the data and continually improve and sort of push the boundaries of everything that we're doing across a number of our sort of top tier clients um, in the e-com space as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, on that note, I don't know how much of this you can actually share, but what are some of the big clients and or just, you know, successful clients you guys are working with? So we've got quite a lot of um, big clients, especially in the e-com space. I can't share specific names, but we do work with quite a lot of different industries. Um, in my portfolio alone, I've got, you know, a coffee brand that we work with. We've also got um, an online baby store. So, you know, going from selling coffee to selling baby products. Yeah, those strategies um, are quite different. Yeah, very <laughs> different. Also got um, an online fitness store. So yeah, lots of different um, industries, but still very much sort of playing in that e-com game and, and the mix of, of what gets results um, is still fairly similar across those different industries as well. Awesome, and uh, obviously the big elephant in the room, um, I'm sure a lot of people experienced it this year, starts with a C, ends with a 19, and we're all over Wait, it. what are you talking about? Getting <laughs> <laughs> yeah. under a rock. <laughs> Before we get into uh, you know all the successes from Black Friday, Cyber Monday, um, give us a bit of an overview of what you guys experienced in your field this year. 
Yeah, so I guess um, the, the very quick background is obviously Reload, we've been around for 13 years and we started as a B2B agency. We were looking after a lot of government and that kind of thing. But in the last probably six to seven years, we've really pivoted to e-com. So we have a really solid mix now of e-com versus legion. Um, and I guess what we saw when all of this happened um, is I think a lot of e-commerce businesses got a little bit scared, um, which we all kind of did. We didn't really know what was going to happen and what that overall impact was going to be. So what we we kind of saw probably around March was everyone just pulled back and they're just like, oh, let's just like hold everything close to us and don't do anything different um, so they kind of did that and then what we saw was obviously with um, online being such a huge driver then um, you know purely out of necessity um, what we saw was everyone just completely ramped up um, so we've seen a lot of businesses that have kind of taken what was probably on their list for two years time digital transformation or a new e-commerce store they have kind of propelled that to then be done in such a short period um, and the businesses that have done that have really sort of started to see um, huge growth um, in the last six months. Yeah, and I think they're the ones that really thrive throughout this process because as we all know, 2020 was really the year of the unknown. Nothing that had, you know, worked previously was guaranteed to work. The trends that, you know, we look at of the last three, five years to try and decide how we plan the next year completely went out the water because we didn't know if those trends were going to stick, if they were going to be amplified, if they were going to disappear completely. So really the clients and businesses that we worked with that remained extremely agile and moved very fast are the ones that we've seen now, you know, six, eight months later, um, hopefully getting to the tail end of the dreaded COVID, um, are, are actually stronger and better off for it. Um, we went to a, a marketing networking meeting a couple of weeks ago and one of the speakers there was talking about that in their company they had a, a five-year plan to implement essentially a content strategy mm -hmm. and when COVID hit they had to they had to change extremely fast and they basically took that five-year plan and implemented it within two months wow. yeah. um I mean, they probably didn't implement it to the same quality as they would have over five years, but the difference is that they got it in market and they are now reaping those benefits now instead of in five years. And from my perspective, we saw that across quite a lot of clients and it was really cool to see that, you know, all these projects that, you know, have to go through 20 different rounds of feedback and take two years to implement, you know, businesses didn't have a choice. They essentially had to pivot and change now or basically lose out. Um, so it's pushed a lot of our clients a lot more forward and it forged them to be a lot more innovative quickly than what they probably would have been otherwise. And I think for the future of, you know, especially online business as a whole, it's going to really reduce some of that, you know, scaredness around change because they've realized that by changing so quickly, actually nothing bad happened. Yeah. And it is good to adapt quite fast. And now they've got um, actual so data I, to make decisions yeah. about going forward rather than exactly. faux data yeah. or other people's data. They have their own data. So it makes sense. A hundred percent. And just sort of building that confidence around, you know, being innovative and trying things and testing things and, you know, not trying to strive for um, perfection. But yeah, perfectionism yeah. in marketing, but actually just getting it in market, especially in the online space. You can switch and change and optimize so quickly in the online space that that's far more important than, you know, planning out a strategy over five years when you could launch it now, reap the benefits and, you know, in five years time be 10 times better than what it would have been. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually quite interesting what you guys said about everybody holding back. You know, the data that we were seeing is like the cost per clicks, the cost per acquisition was so low that, you know, we don't do mm -hmm. AdWords or Facebook campaigns. We pass them to you guys to do a fantastic job but we were, we were like screaming at, at these merchants saying go 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 this is the time yeah. um, and those that like you said yeah. that jumped on it adapted they uh, they, they either leapfrog their competition or they've really left them in the dust um, and it's been a very successful year for a lot of merchants this year which um, yeah I mean that's what I love about digital marketing you mentioned some of those tactics uh, and, and, and things people tried I don't know without sharing too much detail are there any sort of interesting tactics that you guys uh, implemented for clients or they came to you with that, that stand out? Um, a really cool one, which is one of my favorite stories actually, was um, a business who they use their online store to create sort of leads and then they handle all of their sales at the retail store level. 
Um, and essentially, they obviously couldn't do that anymore. So their business model, they had to completely change it because they couldn't have people in store and taking them around the showroom to complete that sale. Um, and they had been talking about maybe doing like a video sales um, sort of tactic for quite a while, um, but it hadn't gotten across the line. And when COVID hit, when COVID hit they um, implemented it nationwide within two days. Um, and essentially shifted the way that they were selling to have, um, you know, completely video, like measuring, quoting, doing everything virtually, um, which they had never done before, which was really, really cool to turn that around. And they actually saw success off the back of it within the first two days of rolling it out as well. Cool. That's, I love it. Did you have others? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of clients that we worked with that um, I guess had a lot of budget that was pushed into footfall driving campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so when sort of COVID hit and we knew that that budget was then going to, I guess, be allowable to use for e-com, um, even just like you said before, Leo, like the CPAs were so low. Um, so we were just pushing so much budget into search and existing demand um, because we didn't necessarily need to create it. And we were trying different channels that maybe they haven't been involved with before mm. um, what we kind of saw with COVID is that you have this perception pre-COVID as to who your customer was they might have been like young female age between 18 and 25 as soon as COVID hit you had this whole new customer that never would have had to shop with you before and then they out of necessity had to switch brands so we started to see then you know the 35 to 45 year olds actually shopping online so actually being where they are even being advertising because that's the platform that's automatically built into some um, web browsers on desktops and some people don't know how to change that so there was a whole new area that we never even tapped into before for some audiences so it was a lot of test and learn but because CPAs were so low we had the ability yeah, to do that yeah, as well. Absolutely and with that with reload media seeing so so much data now through the COVID, through everything, even your 11, 12 years that you guys have been doing this. What do you think is going to stick around for, for next year? Yeah, so I think there's a few interesting things. I think um, what we've kind of seen, especially in the Australian market, is that the households that were previously maybe going to move to online shopping um, in the next three to five years are now all online shoppers. Um, so there's a few things I think about really trying to capitalise and make sure they stay online. But I think with Australia and New Zealand, we kind of have this need to go into the shops whether it's to escape home like you just want an hour to yourself to go shopping and try clothes on i don't think that's ever going to change um but we just need to make sure that we're adapting so there's things like allow people to book um a consultation with the salesperson when they actually come into the store um people are going to do far more research before they actually visit the store um so i think by making sure you are there for the digital touch point but then also giving them the opportunity to come in you'll make sure that you're actually going to target that legacy customer but still kind of be there for I guess those new research terms that they're likely going to do before they actually come in store now yeah I absolutely think, well, and I think oh sorry go there you go <laughs> I was gonna say well you had a stat about a percentage of people looking online before yeah, they walk don't, into a store don't quote me on this I think I actually read it in uh in your guys um uh, playbook that you guys launched and it was uh, 40 something percent of people actually now researching before going into a retail store and then going and completing the purchase right yeah mm. that, and the awesome. other thing is to and I think of you know, always try and think of myself as a consumer when it comes to retail is that you're not only researching before you go in store, but when you're then browsing the shelves and you're seeing certain products, you're also researching whilst you're. Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially going to 2021 and, you know, paid advertising. We know and we've seen over 10 years cost per clicks and CPAs. Um, you know, there's obviously always those periods where they're at their lowest, like at the start of COVID, but year on year, those costs that Going to, going to continue to rise um, and they have been rising they're going to continue to rise so how do we actually make sure that we're getting efficiency in but also ensure that we're actually measuring success accurately mm -hmm. because if someone's in your physical retail store and they're on your website researching that's just as important as getting the sale online because if that's going to help them get to your checkout and buy 
you know, how do we actually measure the success of that versus just return on ad spend and what happens in the online space and how many sales you're getting online, especially for those businesses that do have physical retail stores. Um, I think, yeah, the big thing for 2021 is to make sure that you're measuring success at the right points in the customer journey and also measuring the right data points for success too. Very well said. Something that we try to educate <laughs> a lot of merchants every day. Um, Absolutely. Is there certain examples of how you guys measure success from what you just mentioned? Someone's walked into your store because they were on your website first. Are you guys got any tools that can measure the amount of foot traffic from a campaign that they've been doing with you? Yeah, so I guess from an online perspective in terms of people researching before they get into store, there are obviously those leading indicators that we can have a look at, like did they use your store locator, did they click on get directions, you know, all these types of touch points indicate to us that they're likely to go into your store. Um, on top of that, there's also a couple of, you know, bigger players um, in the market who have used different things like beacon, like beacons and um, those types mm -hmm. of technologies where it actually sort of tracks your GPS signal as you get into store. Um, and I think, you know, over the next sort of two to five years, we're probably going to see more and more of that because people want to prove the return of their online spend. Mm -hmm. And we know that in the retail game, if you've got physical stores, you know, proving the return on that spend is not just going to come from an online sale. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. as well, there's even like, we kind of look at different sort of lead indicators. So we might blend different data sources because you're never going to get that true, you know, every single touch point that, that one customer had. Um, so we work with a national ice cream company and mm -hmm. we basically did like footfall driving campaigns um, once they were reopened. And what we looked at was the total amount of people that saw those campaigns. Um, and then we also then overlaid that with the like hourly sales data that we then got from the actual retail outlet. Mm -hmm. So that you're never, I don't think it's ever going to be perfect, um, but it's yeah. about understanding what data you actually have available that you can then blend together to get an idea of if those campaigns had worked. And then I think also to add to that as well, even just looking at the different attribution models. So not just looking at, you know, paid is the only one that's driving that traffic. It's like, well, if they've come through a pay channel and then they've gone organic and then they saw you on Facebook and then they went into the retail store, all of those different touch points have played, a, I guess, played a part in that overall transaction. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. absolutely critical because we've known for a few years now that the customer journey is not linear in any way, shape or form. And, you know, even if you if you think of yourself as a consumer and how you research online, you know, you might do a Google search and then you'll be hit with a Facebook ad and then and you'll add something to your cart, you'll get distracted, then you'll get an email saying you forgot something in your cart. And, you know, it's really important to make sure that we're looking at the contribution of all of these different touch points together to, to be able to make up that sale. But at the same time, you really need to make sure that you're planning your paid tactics to a T because you don't want to be paying for someone to click on your ad, you know, 10 or 20 times when you've already captured their email address and you could hit them with email to try and recapture that that sale. So really important to not only look at what all the different sources that are attributing to a sale, but also how do you manage those sources of traffic when people are at different stages of the funnel um, and not only look at paid as one source, but also how do you then funnel that into acquisition of email subscribers and then use that drive email sales, which is a lot cheaper and more cost effective than a Google ad and vice versa. How can you use all the you know juicy data about your customers that are in your email database and funnel that back into your Facebook ads to then be able to target your ads even better as well? Yeah, the, the word I'm just uh, hearing there is supplement. I think all of your marketing strategies really need to supplement each other. Um, yeah, because if you're just if you're just going to go all in on one, you may have some good success, but you are when you look at the macro, it's you're losing out on, on, on other potential data or sales or just exposure that, that you could have very easily got when you're already paying for that traffic to come through to your website. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to actually just because I know we're talking there's a lot of people here who understand all of these acquisition models and you know, I've been quite disconnected myself from digital marketing as a whole for at least a couple of years now. So definitely have lost a lot of knowledge because I know how fast it changes. But uh, for the everyday e-commerce person, we know that along with COVID, there was a huge change. People lost their jobs. Um, you know, they, they've changed and they maybe started an e-com store and they're completely new to the world. They've just basically got through the whole e-commerce um, build and they've got something they're proud of now. Can you guys just talk at a very high level of, you know, what are some of the strategies that you would, uh, you would recommend people start implementing um, into their site? 
I might start because yeah. I think there's one thing that's kind of a huge overarching um, strategy that really needs to align to any new business now. And I think yeah. it's developing a brand. Like, I yeah. think what we've kind of seen when it comes to COVID is, like you said, everyone has been impacted or you at least know someone who's been impacted. So it kind of hits quite close to home. And what we've seen in the studies is I think 80% of consumers now opt to shop locally and 70% of those have decided that even once COVID is over, they're still going to support local and they're going to support brands that they actually stand for something. So if you've developed a brand that is either supporting local or it has some sort of local meaning, um, make sure that comes across in everything that you do because people are now so receptive to that. And I think that's especially important for New Zealand customers as well. Um, I mean, you guys are, are New Zealanders, so I'm sure you can attest to this, but I've done a lot of research in terms of, you know, we've got a lot of clients in Australia, but they also then want to expand over to New Zealand as well. Yeah. And if we, you know, if you do a copy paste strategy, it's not just not going to work. You know, New Zealanders, they want to support local, they want to buy local. <laughs> They want, to, uh, want it to be delivered local. So having that brand, um, especially for that New Zealand market, is so critical and to show sort of how you are integrating into that local market and how you're supporting it, um, really, really important, as Em said. That's a really yeah. key thing there. So that, yeah. as underpaid tactics, you know, that's really going to – it sounds like you're saying – if you do sell in Australia, make sure maybe the landing page is all about Australia or at least try and be local in, in that key area. Is there any other yeah. paid tactics that you see uh, going to be changing or need to be in place for 2021? Yeah, so I guess when we think about any kind of paid marketing activity, um, we always, as I mentioned at the very start, everything we do is all about that customer journey. So figuring out who your customer is and then mapping the right paid marketing tactics to that particular customer. Um, so we always talk about it as like your funnel. So it's like what do you need to do for that particular customer at the awareness stage of that kind of sits in your awareness driving tactics. Um, the biggest thing here is like, do you need to create demand? So does does your product not exist yet and you need to educate and create demand for it? Or is there already demand for that particular product and you can just capture it? So that would be things like demand creation would be things like social media, even digital PR, content production, um, even doing keyword research into the types of keywords that people are searching for and then doing paid campaigns for those research terms. Um, if it's demand capture, literally as simple as setting up a shopping campaign, setting up Google ads, um, and just kind of hyper-targeting to start off with. So you can kind of um, use a controlled budget to kind of reach those audiences. Yeah, I think definitely um, Google is a great place to start, especially for new businesses, if there is a want for that product. Um, because the these are the in-market searches, you know, they're actively looking for your product and searching for keywords in relation to your product. So the first step that you need to do is essentially just be there and be where they are and make sure that you've got your campaign set up, you know, competitively enough to compete against the other advertisers who are already trying to get those people in that market as well. Um, I mean, Google Ads in particular has changed quite a lot over the last couple of years, um, you know, leaning a lot more into machine learning and artificial intelligence and using all the data points that they can to essentially like automatically serve and optimize your campaigns. Um, based on all of the knowledge that they have about people, which being Google, you could imagine is quite, quite a lot. Um, and you know they're able to search, look at all of these data points, um, you know, so quickly and so rapidly, more than ever humanly possible, and then lean into that sort of machine learning for your campaign. So, from a Google Ads perspective, um, it's actually quite easy to set up, say, a search campaign or a Google Shopping campaign. You know, Google have got smart shopping campaigns that you can set up now, where essentially you upload your product feed and give Google all the information that they need to know about your products, and then they use their machine learning to go out and make sure that your ads are being shown in front of the right people. Um, and that's really, really powerful, especially for, um, you know, new to business merchants who may not have a digital agency that they're working with yet, because they're still, um, you know, being able to use and lean into a lot of that automation, um, I think is really, really key. Yeah, and a lot of that automation is actually coming into the platform now. I know you can activate Google Shopping as a sales channel within Shopify now, and it can automatically scan mm -hmm. all your products yeah. and then tell you which ones yeah. you can and can't, you know, loosely. There's still a little bit of tweaking. Yeah, there's still a bit there. of work, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean... <laughs> 
Uh, like you guys are saying, some of the things are very easy, but I mean, where you know people need to be talking to you guys is exactly what you mentioned: the awareness stage, the consideration stage, the mm -hmm. uh, decision stage, and all of that brings different type of marketing tactics. All of that is different messaging. All of that can be different yeah. landing pages. How to bring them back, like you said, when you lose them from going from the abandoned cart and then recapturing them again from a organic or social media post. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you can set up something, but you can really stuff it up. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to totally understand that. Um, 2021 is around the corner. You guys have just released a new ebook. You guys do this quite often, and they're fantastic ebooks, by the way. Yeah. Um, sometimes I, Thank you. sometimes I'm <laughs> like, we should have done that. Um, tell me, <laughs> it takes a lot of time. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I'm sure you guys. Are I've really looked busy at some of the material yeah. that they just personalize and send through to some of the clients we yeah. put in front of them, and I'm like, whoa, you know, you can really tell that you guys put a lot of thought, <laughs> and there's a lot of experience in them behind, um, you know. You're and definitely you're the authority. About you're you're you definitely the authority do. in your space, and you definitely know what's going on in APAC um, and I'm sure global as well. But um, maybe tell us about this ebook. Yeah, so um, we released an ebook um, at the start of the year, just when COVID was hitting, um, that was talking about, I guess, the COVID impact for retail. Um, so as a follow up to that, once we had more research data, we've now produced a 2021 retail playbook. Um, essentially what we've done here is looked at all of the worldwide research that's happened because of COVID, um, looked at consumer behavior, what we're kind of seeing in the market, um, what big retailers have done, what they've done well, maybe ones that have not done so well so that we can kind of learn from all of that. Um, and then we've then taken a laser focus down to, I guess, the Australian market um, and looked at the key things that we've seen happen within Australia that we're then predicting um, will then be kind of rolling out in 2021. Um, I think one of the biggest things a huge part of the research was really aligning to what happened in Victoria because I guess when we think about the rest of Australia we kind of had it pretty easy um, in Australia in Victoria and even in New Zealand like you guys had some of the harshest lockdowns that we've ever seen um, and what we kind of saw in Victoria was the obviously there was a clear spike when that first lockdown happened um, there were a few key products that were selling really well online it was groceries it was alcohol obviously <laughs> um, and then when the restrictions started to ease we saw that drop kind of come down a little bit for people that were engaging online. When that second lockdown happened, the spike was actually higher. So yeah. what we kind of gained from that is that these behaviors are now, it's amplified. Yeah. People are starting to get used to it and they're gonna do it more and more. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to capitalize this on as an industry because it's not going to change. I think we will see some people return to normal and normal shopping behaviors, but it is, online is around to stay now. And I think Australia and New Zealand, we've been kind of three to five years behind the rest of the world. Um, and I think our growth rate in Australia is probably going to be the biggest in the world because we have started from a lower base. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely see us kind of starting to be on par with the other regions in the world now. Yeah, I'm definitely feeling the same thing on the ground here when I'm talking to newer clients, um, you know, or well-established clients. There's definitely been a mind shift um, change. And yeah, people are now actually looking at what would we have wanted to be doing in five years time and how fast can we get that happening yeah. now? Um, which is yeah. amazing. One of the things I want to talk to you guys about, because I just know, and again, being on the ground, these are things that people try to pick my brains about. You know, why should I do paid social media advertising? And I, I mean, I give them my version of the answer, but you know, in, in terms of talking to some of the professionals here, we've got you know a wide demographic of people listening. Uh, any yeah. any key um, things you guys can point out for people? So I guess from a paid social advertising perspective, um, the first thing I would say is, you know, it's not that you have to do it. Um, and really, as Em has sort of said earlier as well, like what we do is really drill down into, okay, what are you selling? Where are your customers? And, you know, are they actually on social? So before asking yourself why I should, you know, should I be on social? You need to really, I guess, have a look at are your customers on social? And it is so critical for you to be there because you just think about how many hours a day are spent by your customers on these social platforms. And it's a really cost effective way to get your brand in front of those people. Mm -hmm. um, more and more social is becoming a lot more than just Facebook. As we know, you know, there's Instagram, there's TikTok, there's um, 
you know, there's even new ones. I heard one the other day, which is a specific, like uh, um, for gamers. It's a new social platform oh, yeah. that's coming out um, just for gamers, and now they're starting to push push ads on those as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're spending so much time on social media, and I think from a consumer perspective, we expect. Um, so from a brand's perspective, if you're not capitalizing on that engagement and making sure that your brand um, is getting in front of your customers, then essentially you're just leaving that up for your competitors to get that grab instead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. grab. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've yeah. said this to Waldo many times. The only time an ad gets in front of me is a podcast or social media. I do not yeah. watch TV. Like, yes, I watch Netflix, mm. but there's no there's no ads there. Yeah. Well, there might be product yeah. placement, but that's different. Um, <laughs> but so, and, and that's exactly, you know, I'm not the only one like this. And, you know, there's a yeah. reason why we're doing the podcast, but we do want to educate people. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's these, these businesses. That's so true, and especially, you know, if your if your brand if you want to get your brand in front of those sort of younger demographics and you know think of the next generation of people who are growing up with smart devices I mean I've got a three year old son and he's already got an iPad and gets hit with YouTube ads yeah, so you know absolutely. in twenty years time you know that's going to be the future of of who these brands are going to be selling to so if you're not getting into that sort of social media market then you're essentially going to miss out on the next generation as well because yeah. when they're not watching TV as you said. They're on Netflix and yeah. um, you know streaming, and so you know how do you balance getting in front of the people who are watching TV and listening to radio and driving past billboards because you still need to get in front of those people. It's still a huge portion of the market, but how do you also then tap into these new behaviours that are coming up in sort of next generations and in our sort of digital generation as well around podcasts and social media and all yeah. those other channels? And it can, it does open up so many more channels available to a marketer than has ever been before. So it's sort of, I guess, can be quite overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but the key is like, if your customer is there, you should also be there. Um, can, I just, can I just add something as well? I guess when we're thinking about social media advertising, it comes back to that customer journey. Mm -hmm. So it's like, are they on Facebook when you think you can hit them with an awareness ad or are they on Facebook when you think you can hit them with a sale ad? Like it kind of comes back to when are they actually ready for that particular And I don't know if you guys know the name of that gaming get gaming social platform. I can't remember it for the life of me. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's not so, new. Come on. No. But I think they're just, they're just starting to do advertising on yes. there. Right. And I think a really good example of how you can think you know where your audience is and you're like, cool, I'm going to advertise on that platform. I think it was Honda. Don't yeah, quote me on that. I saw that. They created Honda. an ad and everyone just attacked them. They're like, why am I seeing this ad? They don't want mm. to see it then and there. Mm. So it's really making sure that you really think about who you're targeting and are they actually going to be receptive to that yeah. particular ad yeah. at that point in time? Yeah. I think Where you don't want client? to annoy them. <laughs> Where is yeah, my client? Think, Where is their attention focused? And um, yeah. you know, can I actually capture that attention with something that yeah. is not salesy, maybe not too brandy, but at the right time of the day, um, you know, yeah. appropriate to each? And and I think that's yeah. the key thing. It's where is the attention at? And the attention nowadays just split over so much more uh, technology than it was in the past. It mm -hmm. used to be just radio, print, and TV, and now there's just yeah. so much more. And I think that. Um, do you guys agree like social media advertising is underpriced and undervalued at the moment for the amount of attention that you can get from a from an, an everyday budget that's available compared to having to be in the 90s where you had massive budgets required to get your brand in front of the same amount of people so obviously mm -hmm. along with that comes an opportunity where now is the time because when the Hondas and the you know Coca the, the Coca-Colas and those guys start pumping all of their um, their media spend into social is going to drive that price up. And for people who in today's world can actually take full advantage of that situation and maybe aren't thinking about doing it, well, hopefully, you know, what you're seeing these bigger brands doing will actually give you a little bit of a push to, uh, to, to start channeling it in there. Yeah, 100%. absolutely. And I think, you know, with social advertising, you can liken it to a billboard, really. But instead of people driving past your brand, they're scrolling past your brand. Um, the only difference is that people don't really have expectations from a billboard. Um, but when it comes to social media, you know, your 
or getting in front of people time, you know, in their personal time when they're trying to catch up on what their family is doing. So consumers do have expectations of brands and social media, as we saw from that sort of Honda example um, as well. So what's even more important, in my opinion, you know, more than getting in front of the right people at the right time and on the right channel is actually making sure you're getting in front of them with the right message. Yeah. Um, and one of the big things from there is, you know, you take a social media strategy and a lot of brands will sort of take that and roll out the same strategy across all social media platforms. <laughs> but the difference is, you know, we need to remember that people actually use Facebook differently to how they use Instagram and differently again to how they use, you know, other channels. So it's really important to not only know your audience, but also know the channel and why your audience is on that channel and how you can communicate them, communicate to them in the right way, um, depending on how they're using each of these channels. Well, well said, Amy, because I was about to say the same thing. So brownie points to you. Yeah. Great um, minds think alike. Great minds think alike. That's the one. Hey, back to this ebook because we're, we're going all over the place. But um, back yeah. to this ebook, what are some highlights uh, for me to read? And who, who should be reading this? Marketing managers, general managers, business owners? Who should be reading this ebook? Everyone. Yeah, OK. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, look, it's really interesting, I think, to get an idea of what's happened last year and what those expectations are going to be for the new coming 2021. Um, there's a lot of really interesting data in here. I think it's like 21 pages long. Um, I know that we're adding a bit to this podcast as well. So um, I'm sure you guys will organize that on your end. But click I think, the link below. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Click, link, click, click here. Click, like, That's right. That's no, right. Absolutely. And I know it's easy <laughs> just to say that, guys, but you know, it's really hard for you know, for us to get really good quality statistics. Sometimes it's just Europe or global or just the US. Yeah. Um, you know, this this stuff's local to all you Aussies listening to this podcast. And as we know, guys, it's just the West Island. So a lot of these are <laughs> amalgam, you know, these a lot of these are appropriate to uh, New Zealand as well. Yeah. 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 I think some of the biggest things that we got out of this research is um, the, the households that are now shopping online, I think we're starting to reach a critical mass. Um, so it's about making sure that any customer that you have got during COVID, you need to keep them. Yeah. Um, people switch brands so easily. So it's how can you actually keep them in, in your kind of, um, in your audience database. Um, and then also that there's those three new shoppers. There's the new shopper who's only going to shop online. There's the, is only going to come into store, but then you've got this cool hybrid. So actually making sure sure you have all of the CRM systems to actually understand who that customer is. Um, we've kind of put together, I guess, some of the um, overall business and sort of strategy initiatives we'd recommend for clients going into 2021, um, their e-commerce and digital initiatives, and then also retail initiatives. So um, take a read through that. Um, there's a whole bunch of cool stats in there and hopefully, you know, you can pull a few things out. That would be That's really awesome. And it sounds like there's something in there for everyone, really. So really encourage you guys. Yeah. Click the link below. Get if we in. haven't said it, it's called the 2021 Retail Playbook. I'm not sure if that's why there's 21 pages. Is that a coincidence? Oh, actually, we absolutely planned There's that. actually 22. Yeah, okay. I right. totally <laughs> should delete. Just get rid of one page. There you go. Um, but yeah, definitely um, reloadmedia.com.au um, and you'll be able to find this ebook. Of course, like we've mentioned, the, the link will be on this as well. Um, but yeah, I guess I want to talk a lot more about it, but yeah, you're I giving away, giving stuff away some, hours yeah, with you there's, guys. Some, there's some great stuff <laughs> Maybe here. Maybe we'll take it offline. Honestly, we could talk forever yeah. about digital and 21 honestly it could go on for a really long last, time last <laughs> last but not least because this hasn't been said uh Zyber, over the 11 12 years that we've been going similar to you guys have partnered up with many different um adwords seo sort of partners in the past um we've even tried to do it ourselves at one time and said now too hard let's leave it for the professionals um we're, we're really good at building and you know cro stuff on e-commerce but um with you guys it's been a pleasure to partner with you guys uh, you're very transparent on what you do with the clients clients understand exactly where every dollar is going to which other agencies kind of hide that they don't know what percentage that you're taking away from them and the feedback we've got back from our merchants is that you guys are a bunch of smart cookies um, not just once but multiple times so i want to say thank you and um you know really looking forward to yeah uh, i mean definitely if you're, 
Sorry. To yeah, you're like, you. If you're a marketing up, right. nurse, I'm so good at that. <laughs> hey, apologies, mate. That's um, right. No, definitely, guys. I mean, if you're out there and you're uh, you're not happy with uh, what's happening at the moment, you're paying for um, you know digital marketing and social media strategy, and at the end of the month, you're getting a one page of saying we spent this and you made that. We got your that's heaps of clicks. That's not what's important, guys. Um, check out Reload <laughs> Media. Um, like they said, they've got a global presence. They understand e-commerce and um, they understand Kiwis and Aussies, and that's the most important thing. Be about being able to speak to people who have been around for a long time and uh, yeah, completely understand this tech. So, Absolutely. I mean, on that note, I don't have much else to say. Is there anything else you guys wanted to leave us with? No, I just want to also say thanks to yeah. you guys. I know that we work on a bunch of joint clients now and I think the, the teams and how we kind of partner with you guys, we're an extension of your team and you're an extension of ours and I think we're always working together to get those best results for clients. And so, yeah, I just want to say thanks as well and thank you for inviting us on this podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. You guys are more than welcome. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great Christmas. No worries. Bye. Bye.